So, anyway. Yeah. We'll just go through, yeah. through a few things. I think I'm all, yeah. all ready to go. So, if you can just sort of just give us a bit of a background of um, your involvement with foxes and fox ecology before you got involved in Tasmania. Oh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, prior prior to Tasmania, what I was um, involved with in a, in a professional sense was doing uh, work on foxes in urban areas, which I did with Clive Marks, and that was about looking at um, foxes in urban areas, their movements and um, their uh, spatial distribution of foxes and um, in, in a variety of different urban environments. So we tracked foxes at Webb Dock, at um, Baldwin, at um, uh, the Botanic Gardens, um, there were two sites out in the Baldwin sort of area and um, that that was looking at the way in which um, uh, you know, what was this, the distribution of dens, what were the sorts of numbers of foxes in those areas and what was their behaviour. Yeah. And prior to that I've done a, a significant amount of um, fox control, baiting, baiting work, um, trapping, shooting foxes, both for government departments and um, private recreation. Mm -hmm. um, and how much of that um, knowledge that you gained um, prepared for the actual, prepared you for the Tasmanian situation? Well, the um, Tasmanians, and I think it might have been initially Nick Mooney, contacted the then Keith Turnbull Research Institute, who had a vertebrate pest research area, because they were looking for some information on fox ecology and behaviour, which they could use um, in determining whether foxes were present or not in their in their environment. So I was contacted to run some uh, courses for them and design a course uh, to give them enough information to be able to determine presence. Was that prior to when evidence started coming to light, or was that after the '98? Incident. Oh, that was that was in um, in um, two thousand and um, two thousand, wasn't it? Two thousand or two thousand and one. Um, was it in a response to? It was in, it was in response to um, the uh, incidents at Longford. Mm. So there was the. Um, English tourists who thought they heard some foxes, I think it was at Longford or, or somewhere yeah, near there. there. Yeah. Um, there were some reports from some others about foxes, including what was described as you know, good reports. Um, and so there was a belief that um, there may have been foxes present and what they, were, what they didn't have is they didn't have skills pertinent to being able to tell whether an animal was present or not. So the very basic uh, course was designed around being able to determine whether that's a fox footprint or not, um, the types of places foxes might go, the sorts of things that foxes might do, uh, really basic things like the colour of eye shine of foxes in a spotlight as against native animals. So I ran a course that provided that information to them. Who else was involved in that? Oh, there was a number of people. Michael Johnson, um, who still works for Arthur Ryler, he was he was there. Um, a contractor, private contractor, uh, Alex Christick, who um, uh, oh, he parted, provided some help with one of the tours that we did. Um, I think we might have also. Oh, I'm not sure whether Steve McPhee was also involved in that. There's a number of people that we had that presented to them. Aside from the evidence that was cropping up with the sightings and yep. the footprint which you, you found yourself? No, that was found by one of the, um, I forget what they were called then, we were called field officers sure. at the time at, the, at that lake, at um, well that swamp, swampy land there. Um, but the the print, the plaster cast that was taken of that, that was then sent around to other um, agencies around Australia, to particular, um, we'll call them fox experts, uh, to get their view of what they thought that footprint was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, and um, when you were brought in at this time, um, as well as this evidence showing up, mm. there was also stories that foxes had been imported. Yeah, look, there, that um, seemed to be the the sort of the foundation of the reason for action. So. Um, People believing that they saw foxes in Tasmania was something that had occurred, you know, it had occurred previously. People see thylacines, people see lots of things. So um, the evidence had, had appeared to increase sufficient for them to believe that they had to take some action. So that's why they had a course. Then uh, that um, I went over there to look at their environment because of had very little experience in, in Tasmania. So their statements of the volumes of animals that they had, I found a little bit hard to believe in the uh, wildlife wilderness that is Victoria. We just simply don't have the same levels of animals and it's probably due, due to foxes. So I looked at that environment and put what I knew about foxes in this environment into, into that situation and you know, it's, it's quite clear that any fox would uh, survive extremely well in that environment. I mean, apart from the climate is ideal, um, it's abundant with food sources. So I went over there, and when I went over there, it was the same time that the footprint was found in the mud. Um, just sort of skipping ahead just a yeah. little bit on that. Um, given how... Oh, oh, sorry, I just remember one, yeah. one other thing. Whilst we were running the course, there was a f photo in the the examiner of two fellas with their heads down, with foxes hanging from uh, a fox, I should say, hanging from a. Um, what did they have it holding? Uh, holding, holding it, it holding the it sign. under the yep. the, the sign that said Longford or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'm sort of slowly getting to the bottom of that. Oh, yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. I know who it was, and yeah. Unfortunately, that got included in the evidence, which made the whole thing seem a bit incredible to people. Mm. But anyway, that's that aside. Um, yeah. But just just getting ahead to um, you said how wonderfully suited to foxes Tasmania environment yeah. was. Yeah. Does it amaze you that they haven't taken off? Oh, I, I did expect them to. I gave them basically about seven years. I thought seven years. If you look at the movement, the introduction of foxes into Australia, and if you look at how they move through the landscape, and um, uh, from bounty payments, you can see that they became quite abundant basically in a five to seven year period. So they moved from these sort of loci uh, of, of Corio Bay and probably the foxes released uh, somewhere near Adelaide. Um, there's also this group at Ballarat, but it take it appears that it takes around about five years before rabbit uh, foxes are so um, uh, easily found that you and I could go out and shoot one and collect a bounty. There is a period of time where, as a cryptic species, they're quite difficult to find, and then they become quite abundant. So it's just this curve and mm. it's, it's quite natural so you get to that sort of point of that around about five to seven years if you look at the bounty payments as they were made through New, New South Wales as foxes spread in, into there in the 18th century you can see that effect um, so I reasonably consider that that same sort of thing could happen in, in Tasmania and that it would be somewhere in that sort of vicinity of seven years more like 10 or 11 years on now. Yeah, we are. So then the other factor, the other factor is what are the predators doing to them? So effectively a baiting program is like a predator. It, it reduces their abundance and it reduces, it, it, it just quietens down what's, what's occurring in the population. So if you take an example of that, you say if you looked at uh, Phillip Island, 100 square k's with somewhere in the vicinity of 0.1 foxes per square k, they are, to all intents and purposes, to the 6,000 people who live on Phillip Island, invisible. So if you speak to people at Phillip Island, you will find that the majority of people have not seen a fox this year. They saw one a couple of years ago. 
Oh, they know someone who saw one. But foxes are certainly there. So what we, you know, you've got a population level where uh, animals are easily found, and then you've got a population level where it, it, they're difficult to find. It could be suggested that the baiting programs have that effect of culling the population. Mm. The I'm other sure. thing that occurs in small populations is you get um, what's referred to as drifting territoriality, is that your animals are moving on a fairly constant basis. Yep. So, um, look, there's another uh, explanation. Um, they're not there. Right. And uh, it's all been an elaborate and brilliantly planned hoax. Uh, and if that's the case, I'd like to get those people involved in Israel and Pakistan, uh, 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 Palestine, I should say. You know, it's, that to me seems incredible. Mm. Well, I'd, if it was a hoax, they could have done a much better one. That's what, well, <laughs> that's you know, let's just, let's just say the hoaxes are also a little incompetent. Yeah, that's it. Um, if there was no foxes in Tasmania, it would be a wonderful thing. It would be an absolutely wonderful thing. I would be very, very happy with that. And if it only cost $20 million to do that, then that would also be a wonderful thing. Because what will be lost by foxes in there, will, it's, it's too horrendous to, to contemplate. That's a, something everyone can yeah. agree with yeah. across the board. Um, I'd suggest there was a third option, was that they had been introduced as yeah. per the story but yeah. they failed to get established mm -hmm. and what we've seen since then yep. has been the dying out of those ones but um, the yeah. lack of evidence of breeding is um, I mean mm. the fact that foxes are stationary for four months sort of, mm. you'd think that that would make it a bit more no I, I don't you don't I don't I don't not, not at all I do in a fox full population like we go to Werribee Treatment Plant, it's got 16 foxes a square K. Um, we could go there now and we'll find foxes. You and I would go and find foxes now at this time of day. And if we went out at night, we'd see foxes pretty much every 500 metres. So, um, and multiples of them in the distance. That's a, that's a very fox full environment. In low fox populations, it's not the case. In low fox populations, it's ex they're extremely difficult to find. Even when they're breeding? Even when they're breeding. So we'll go to Phillip Island and let's you and I spend a month trying to find dens. Mm. Uh, yeah, in the sad. last two years, no dens been found on Phillip Island where there's been confirmed breeding foxes at. And um, having spent a couple of years working there and crawling over a fairly large proportion of that island, they are very difficult to find, and it's this predator-prey relationship. They're the prey, we're the predator, and we cause them to have to find places that might be sub-optimal for, for um, survival of the cubs, but they will actually be able to have their cubs and not get killed by us. Now, they definitely do have cubs because cubs have been shot. So they've been shot at the dispersal periods like now, and over the next couple of months. But finding the dens, even though hundreds of hours of time go into finding the dens, dogs are also being used for that purpose as well, they haven't been found. Mm. And it, they're not, they're a cryptic species. This is the thing that I think is really important. There are Northern Hemisphere species, they expect to die. They expect that some other animal is going to kill them. Their behavior is not to be found. When the, when the environment is full of them, when it's six to eight foxes per square K, they are easy to find because the predator pressure just simply isn't there. Yep. Uh, so it's, you know, if, if you make the assumption that they're easy to find, then they should have been found. The evidence I'd suggest from places where there's significant predator pressure and they're very low numbers is that they're very difficult to find. Mm. Well, that's what certainly we've been, tell, we've been told. And if you look at I the, think a if you, the public understanding that. If you look at the work, and this is when I was started working in Tassie and people said, "Well, why can't you find them?" And I went to 
you know, I went to Victoria, I used to be a fox shooter, I can tell I got my first E.H. Holden, I shot foxes, they're everywhere. They're easy to find, anyone can do it. You government blokes obviously don't have the skills. If, if we take a fox here, somewhere between Geelong, Ballarat and Hamilton, and we put an ear tag in it, and your only job is to find it, you won't. It, your chances of finding that individual somewhere in that area are so, so slim. And what we're dealing with is a population of very low levels. So the, Samantha Vine did some work in New South Wales where they did the same thing. They tried to create a virtual low density by only having some animals as the ones to find. And it showed very clearly that it's very difficult to do. The most consistent um, evidence of presence was from sightings. Mm. But they could have been wrong. That's the problem with sightings. So on Phillip Island, when I started work there, and I, I, I'll lead this as, as, as example, um, for two weeks I did not have any concrete evidence of foxes being on Phillip Island. I saw prints, but I could have been wrong. I saw animals in the spotlight, but I could have been wrong. I trapped an animal after about two weeks in a treadle snare on the far western end of the island. Uh, that's pretty good, isn't it? But that's got to be close to evidence, isn't it? So I put the trap down. Uh, some days later, caught a fox. Shot that fox, um, did some analysis of it, and uh, we took a piece of, I think we'll take pieces of ear for DNA then, or pieces of tongue, might have been both. Um, months go by, the uh, results come back, and that fox, that male fox, was from the mainland. There were three foxes found in the, in the 15 years of sampling that were from the mainland. I had caught one of them. Clearly, I planted it there. Clearly, it was part of my processes of trying to keep my job on Phillip Island that I put a fox there. Well, that's a reasonable statement, isn't it? Well, for some people. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, the, this is the issue, is that when you look at almost anything that, that is done by people closely, you'll find holes in what they did. You'll find problems in the way they did it. You'll find that they could have done it a different way. They might have asked a different question to somebody. They might have asked more people. They might have taken that advice instead of that advice. You'll always find that. It doesn't mean it's a conspiracy. It means that's what people do. Yep, that's everywhere. Yeah. So it's, they, they are really hard to find in, in low numbers. That is the absolute certainty of it. Yep. DNA sampling of scats has occurred on Phillip Island as well over a couple of year period. My understanding is that not one of those shows a genetic match between another fox found on the island. So there's not a sibling and a sibling. Are there more than one from a single fox? Oh, well, that's an unknown. I mean, there is, on, on, the that, DNA, on the DNA, on the DNA the sampling, there is all of the, there's individuals, they're not, they haven't collected the same individual more than once. Mm. Now with high predator pressure, that might be reasonable. You know, with the high pressure from the Phillip Island range of, ranges to kill every fox they possibly can. Living for two years is probably a bit of a stretch there. So random sampling across the island hasn't brought up what you describe as um, a viable population. Fox scats have been found, but they could have been planted. Why the hell would anyone do it? Well, I know why they do it. Um, um, Steve McPhee and I wrote the, the strategy for eradication of foxes on Phillip Island. Fairly obviously, it would be in my benefit to ensure that that continues, wouldn't it? I could continue to get money out of that organisation. So you can construct a case where my behaviour could be suspect. You can construct a case where I would appear to get some financial or other value out of doing those things. 
And so I made the point to me that nurses don't go around giving people diseases just so they can treat them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. Well, getting so, back to... So anyway, get back to yeah, yeah, a bit. Yeah. Uh, the founding event, mm -hmm. um, which is still... Um, there's a lot of unknowns there. Yeah. What was your experience? What were you told at the time? Who yeah. were you told by? Well, I was told there was a variety of sources, and I can't remember exactly who told me what little bit. But at, at the time, there was people like Chris Ems, um, Nick, Nick Mooney, uh, Stan Matizak, uh, he was a ranger in charge. Um, later on, I got to speak to Glenn, but it certainly wasn't early on, uh, Glenn Atkinson. Um, Who else was involved in that sort of level? Oh, they were probably the main, the main people. Um, and what I'd been, well, what I was informed is that there was a number of people um, who got together uh, and were financed by someone to um, bring foxes in, raise and release them. The rationale behind that, and I, I heard a number of reasons why, but I never heard a statement saying that was the reason why. So the the reasons why this occurred was that they didn't particularly like um, David Llewellyn and it was related to uh, the change in which fellow, the changes that occurred with hunting of fellow deer in Tasmania. Uh, that these people involved in the um, thing, it's all right. Okay, sorry about that. These people, that, the, the people that were involved in this, um, did it for the uh, to get even with Llewellyn because of what had occurred with the change in um, control and shooting of fallow deer. So they were poachers, and this was a, a way of getting even with them. They didn't like government. Um, they were simply mischievous. Um, they wanted to do this because they could. That's they're the reasons that I heard of why it was done. Um, now it could be that it's a combination of all those things. It's you know it's not often a, an individual operates on purely one ra one reason for doing something. Mm. Were, you, uh, were you given names at the time? No, yeah. no, I wasn't given names, and I didn't actually seek them out. Didn't seek, sure. Yeah. Um, and um, the person financing it. Oh, yeah, the person financing was, well, it, I was told the person financing was a fellow who owned a pub in Longford who did a lot of shooting, uh, including a lot of shooting on the mainland as well, and he particularly liked shooting foxes. Even on his Toyota had a silhouette of a fox next to his number plate. So, now, whether all those things have been put together, I don't know. What I do know is that... Um, I was told that there was a financer for this. There was a number of people who were involved in it. Um, one of them lived at Longford, and one of them lived at Campania. Um, that's all I know about them. Um, and then the foxes were raised and released, and the first you know, first effort wasn't very good. The second effort was was better, and the third effort was the best effort. So. Um, were there three lots or three releases? Three, three lots of, of importations and three lots of releases. Yeah. And the places were? The places that uh, released it were Longford, um, Campania, and I heard at the time that there was also a release at or somewhere near St Helens. And that other persons, um, a year or so after this, well, after the second release, other persons um, released uh, some foxes at Burnie. Uh, and there was a, a picture of, there was, um, yeah, there was, there was a picture of a fox at Wynyard, was al allegedly from that. Now, um, I don't know whether, which, which bit of that was true. Um, the statement was also that the person from Burnie were related to the people at Longford, um, 
So here we go, we've got two pe two families that are related in Tasmania. Well, there's a surprise, isn't it? Um. And that this, the foxes were raised at Longford, at a, at a property there, and um, then they were released either some distance from there. Uh, one aspect or well, one story I've heard is that there was an accidental release where the pens, the, a tree branch fell on the pen. Oh, I like, I like that story. That's a good one. Have you heard that? No, no, I like that one because that's some of the great releases of invasive species in Australia have been accidental, so I like that. Yeah. It's good. Well, the story that I've heard is that, um, yeah, there was an accidental release. Stan, I think, got onto it, called Llewellyn directly. Llewellyn mm. jumped up and down and said, right, sent in the police, and mm. the police, by then they bulldozed the pens, mm -hmm. which was... Now, you've seen the aerial photos of the yeah. pens. Can you tell me about that? Well, what I've seen is an, an aerial photo that had... And I've described as being buildings that were buildings, and another aerial photo where they're not there. And I've also been to the site, and there's, well, there's no buildings there, there's nothing there. So, um, that there was, well, the, the reasonable suggest there was because there was something there in an aerial photo. And who told you that? Oh, well, I was shown that um, by, by Chris Ems. Yep, and shown and told this is. Hmm. This is. Yeah. Like, I think, I mean, Chris Parker also was aware of those things and it was a part of the general conversation within the task force. Um, now, there was never any, well, I didn't see much of an investigation of that. I've spoken to Ivan Dean about it and he didn't seem to think much of it because I mean, he was in charge, I mm. believe, although mm. there were other people mm. below him. Um, would, I mean, wouldn't an obvious thing, if, if these things were bulldozed, wouldn't mm. an obvious way of finding out would be to find if sort of um, land moving equipment was used or hired or mm. how it could have been done? Yeah, yeah. And you could have done a forensic examination of the site. Yeah, and as far as I know, neither of those things occurred. And that would have been the police responsibility? I so. I don't know. I'm not sure where the importation of foxes, what act that's under. Is it the Wildlife Act? I don't know. I don't know what act it's under. One of the stories was the statute of limitations ran Yeah, out it does. That's true. And yeah. they couldn't proceed any further. Um, they, and all, yeah. Um, what was I, was I, there's also another story that I've only come across recently it was a fox that was apparently caught in a trip pen in Longford, and this was around similar, around the similar time. Um, mm. People claimed that the, it was in there and they tried to keep it in there so they can get the, and it escaped. Do you recall that at all? It was in no. the newspapers. Um, was it? Yeah. Oh, I can't remember that. Because yeah. that's another clear case of, okay, you've got a, a fox running around in a chook pen, there's got to be some bit of evidence there, and as far as I can tell, as far as I can find out, yeah, yeah. there was no investigation. Well, but, and when did that occur? In 2001? Yeah. Oh, okay. And the report, the newspaper report is, is of that time? Yep. Yeah? Yep. There, there was a couple and they said that they found a fox in that chook pen and they tried to trap it in there but it escaped. But they didn't do any sort of analysis for hairs or blood or anything. Mm. Well, I'd be interested, you know, when that happened and when they reported that to the mm. to the task force. Yeah. Um. But I mean, I'm a, because I don't know anything about that. All I, all I can suggest is that I've I've been surprised with how badly some people get these get things wrong. So a blue Persian cat was definitely a fox feeding on a goose on the side of the road. Absolute certainty. Ab I stopped. I looked at it. It looked back at me. I drove away. It was feeding on the goose. Go to the site, look around. Yeah, there, there's a dead goose on the side of the road. There's a blue Persian cat. Big blue Persian cat. 
it's as close to being a fox as an elephant is. And that person was absolutely certain that it was a fox. Absolutely certain. Infamous story of the task force guy that picked up a dog and took it in for testing, thinking it was a fox. Uh. Okay. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't, I don't know whether that's true, but I know the Persian cat was because I was there. Um. Now, after after foxes started popping up all over the place, there mm. were sightings, there mm. was you know, gathering bits of evidence here mm. and there. Mm. Um, there was one shot. It was, um, and the task force came together. What was your role in that at that point? Uh, when the I got uh, seconded from Victoria to uh, Tasmania to investigate what was occurring with foxes and, and to give a, and to do a review of what had occurred and make some recommendations as to what to do next. So I did that. So I went over there and I spent a couple of weeks there and I collected some evidence, spoke to some people about what they, they'd um, heard and done, etc., and what their actions were, and wrote a report. And um, in that I suggested there was sufficient evidence to, to suggest that foxes uh, were present and that action should be taken immediately to, one, determine whether that is the case and get some more evidence as to whether that was the case because it was very important to be able to uh, ascertain whether they were present across uh, areas beyond the sort of the main sort of foci of, it, uh, of activity which is sort of Longford and Campania um, and then uh, if that if it comes up that there's some ev that evidence of presence uh, indicates that they're in a certain area then to take fairly immediate action, which I suggest it should have been broad-scale baiting. Mm -hmm. And how was that received? Um, it was received by the general manager at the time, Peter Williams, as after Christmas, Tim, uh, we'll keep you on and uh, you'll lead the investigation. I said, so I'll lead it with who? He said, it'll be you. I said, I don't think that will work. I won't be able to do that. You need, you need more people than me to be able to assert whether they're present across this landscape in any sort of you know, reasonable way. You need more than one individual to do that. Um, and he said, no, it'll, it'll be you. I said, well, I, and I suggested to him that the problem with that is that I might get it wrong and my advice would then lead us into a particular direction, which might be, I can't find them, but they might be there. That would then lead to a situation of us having a real problem with foxes later. Why, why did Peter Williams just want you? Uh, Peter Williams just didn't want to pay for the people to do the job. And for your recommendations yeah. to be carried out? He certainly didn't want that. To occur. How did he express that? Oh, well, you know, it'll be you, Tim. That's who it'll be. As far as the recommendation of the base. No, he 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 was not he not interested. He wasn't interested in any of the technical issues about how to control or manage foxes. He was interested in how he was going to justify this expenditure within his budget. And he was not interested in foxes one way or another. He was interested in how he could stop having to expend what was he, he was seeing, a significant amount of money from his budget, which he was not going to get from anywhere else. He wasn't, Treasury wasn't going to turn up and say, well, here, Peter, it looks like there's a bit of a problem, here's a million dollars. He was going to have to justify this from within his budget, and he didn't want to do that. And where was Llewellyn in all this? Um, Llewellyn, as far as I'm aware, was completely unaware of Williams's machinations about the the program, um, I suspect Lil Llewellyn was told that it's all going okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and I mean, Williams had formed, didn't he? I mean, he was in charge of 
quarantine with the 98 box yeah. jumped up. Mm. What were the repercussions there? Well, the, the scuttlebutt was that um, a person brought boxes in to Tasmania for the purpose of embarrassing the government because they had recently stopped the um, quarantine um, inspection services that they were, they were having on weekends. So it, <coughs> so it would appear to be no accident that um, the fox arrived you know, um, on the weekend and the phone call made to a, a, an answering service, I think I saw a fox. So the, then it shows up that there should have been the quarantine inspection services on the weekend. Sorry, when, when was this? This was with the, the Bernie Fox. The 98? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Williams was responsible for the reduction of the quarantine services. So you're saying so, that... No, I'm saying other people said okay. in 98 the, the, that Williams had been responsible for a restructure. I don't know who was in charge of it, whether you know, someone else told him to do it, I don't know. And that um, restructure was a reduction in jobs for people in um, places like Burnie because there was no weekend inspection services. And people suggest that the 98 Fox was deliberately, I mean, you don't get a Fox on a boat <laughs> on no. its own accord, it, it was deliberately. I, I, it's, it's, it is possible that a Fox would walk onto a boat. Um, it's unlikely. Um, that it would um, and look. It's possible that it would walk on a boat because it's done a number of times. Uh, that this is what I've seen happen in the docks. People feed foxes. Security guards, the most, the biggest culprits in that. The next to the kitchen people. Uh, the the next are the wharfies. Uh, there's a lot of downtime. A lot of board time. A lot of there's a fox, let's throw some food out, let's see what we can get it to do, can it eat out of my hand, uh, which the security guards at Web Dock were able to do. It's an impressive effort. Thank God there's security. And at the boat, it's entirely possible that people would have you know, had the same behaviour. Let's see if we can get it on the boat. I mean, I'd do it. If you were sitting there doing nothing, oh, let's see if we can do this. And you've done it a number of times, now you have, might have a reason why it's useful to do. Have you heard that the fox was known to be on the ship while it was... Yeah, I, I have heard that, but at the time, when I was in Tassie in 2001, I had not. I've heard that since. Mm -hmm. And so. the, the, the ship was cleaned, it went back and forth after that and cleaned before they actually investigated the ship. <laughs> yeah, well... Well, indeed, indeed, that's entirely possible. Um, um, did you happen to see the video footage of it? Of the fox? No, I've never seen that. No. Yeah, that's funny because um, a, a couple of people have denied it exists. Right. And it was always said, oh, no, we've got f footage of it. And yeah. No one can find it. Some people say they've seen it. Some people say that there was never any. Um, yeah, look, I've... Yeah. Maybe it do. Yeah. No. I didn't. You know, video cameras are everywhere now. No, they're this well. They, perhaps they are. Perhaps they're just darkly coloured um, domes sitting around all over the place. There's no camera in there at all. There wasn't much of that at that time in '98. There wasn't a lot of video surveillance of many things. So. I'd be interested to know whether there was in fact any a video surveillance unit there in 98. I think the story was that someone actually filmed it with a video camera as opposed to a security yeah. camera of getting out of the boat. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The, is there anything more you can tell me about the well, I can tell you one, one other bit, yep. which, is, which now appears to be interesting, but it wasn't that interesting at the time, is that so when the, the foxes got off the boat in, in Burnie, and um, uh, I was working at Atwood, and um, I got a phone call that 
evening, I think it was, from Clive, saying that this had happened. He'd heard that it had happened and um, that he was going to ring up and um, uh, provide his services, which is a reasonable statement because we'd spent a lot of time tracking foxes in urban environments and maybe a reasonable idea of what they might or might not do. Um, and um, he made that offer and he's, he's told, you're not required. We can... Oh, somebody in park service, I don't know. Now, at the time I was a little bit surprised by that, but since since that, I've met Nick Mooney and his tracking skills, his ability to develop and interpret what an animal's going to do in the landscape pretty damn good. So he'd nearly been my first pick anyway. Getting some other advice from people who'd been tracking foxes in urban areas would probably be a reasonable thing to do. I'm not sure that uh, having experience of what foxes do at docks would be a huge advantage because the Bernie docks are about this big. Um, you, know, and you don't have to walk very far and you're off it. It's not quite like web dock. Um, at the time of the police investigation, which said all they came up with was the people who were named actually existed, they didn't find any evidence. Oh, that's good. That was a good effort then. Yeah, that was yeah. as much as they found. Mm. Um, the way I've heard it was that Glenn Atkinson and maybe Stan were very, very close mm. to these people and mm. Mm. it almost got to the bottom of the story. Mm -hmm and they warn the police, if the police go in, these mm. people will shut up and go to ground. Have you hmm. is that yeah. My, again, what I've been told is that that was the case, that they were, they were very close to um, being able to investigate to the point where they might have been able to charge people. But they didn't quite have enough evidence to be able to do that. They had uh, some informants and, and, and an informant in particular who provided very good information to them, but not sufficient to be able to charge anybody at that point. That information was provided to Llewellyn, and um, I think it might have been provided in person by Stan to Llewellyn, and there was a belief that um, another person in the park's office would have been party to what was occurring and as, as he was married to the then opposition leader, and leader yes. yeah. um, that the opposition would have been aware of that or would have been aware of it by some other process or other method and that uh, the opposition would break that in Parliament that um, foxes had been imported in Tasmania and the government was doing nothing. And so it was at that point that the police were informed to, to go and investigate the incident so that the Minister could then stand up in Parliament and say um, we have some information and we're investigating it. Sure. Um, and we have that informant obviously went to ground. Mm. Have you heard any more about No, look, all I, all I heard was that the, um, the one of the principals in, in the, at, at Longford was a, a fairly violent person and the expectation was that uh, he'd go around and break this bloke's legs, and this bloke was quite well aware that that would be the case. He would do that, and he'd burn his house down, and um, he shut up. Hmm. Now that's the that's well, the story I mean, the that police I heard. documents fully back that up. Actually, they put it under FOI. Yeah. Okay. So now, so my understanding good. is that when the police knocked on the door, they gave more information than they got which caused this person to be able to realise that they were onto him and that he'd take some fairly immediate action to ensure that he didn't get done. Because the case, because there wasn't sufficient evidence and the evidence to, to seal the case we required the informant and the informant went quiet, then there was nothing to be found. Hence, you could suggest that the police stuffed it up. The police failed to uh, be properly briefed. They failed to act in a way in which they could be properly briefed. And then they took it upon themselves to 
investigate this in a fairly heavy-handed manner uh, and it was dropped because the officer in charge at the time didn't believe it or didn't want to believe it and um, so it went nowhere um. this sort of um, behavior between uh, enforcement agencies is not unusual where the police think the wildlife officers are parking cops and the wildlife officers think the police officers are idiots. So if you get that sort of behaviour, you obviously don't get any cooperation out of them. And they both want to just show up the other as being incompetent. Yes. Whether that was a factor in it or not, I don't know. Whether the personal jealousies are a factor in it. Yes. But there was an over, certainly there was an overreaction by the minister at the time. At the time and up until for quite some time after yeah. actually was actually a second was gonna change.